got a few definitions in these slides just to, if anyone's not familiar with some of the jargon, hopefully I'll start to unpack a few of those. Um, so after the last drought, rather than rebuilding our numbers, Dad started looking at more trading. And he started trading um, steers, which are not bulls, so they've been frustrated and they're used for meat, not breeding. So the trading enterprise, it's it's less probably demanding on time, but it really heavily depends on the market price you bought, the growing conditions, and then the amount of the price you get for them. Dad buys a variety of steers, mainly Hereford and Shorthorn, which are down the bottom, as well as Angus, which are the, the black ones up the top. The second prong of our cattle operation is more a traditional approach, um, and we run um, a number of self-replacing Angus cows. So self-replacing refers to a, a base of, of production where you keep females um, that are bred to then um, build up your stock um, for ones that no longer can breed or um, have gotten too old. So this prong obviously takes a little bit more effort because you're, you're really um, concerned with progeny and genetics and improving the viability of your breed. Um, so Angus are actually the most commonly used cattle in beef production originated from, developed from um, cattle that were native to Scotland. Um, and also, so we join an Angus heifer, which is a female that's never given birth before, to an Angus bull, which we also have, um, which are uncastrated males, on the property. And we, the heifer can start um, mating at about two years of age. Um, so we usually sell, sell our calves at the end of the growing season, so at the end of spring. And they either go into our two main supermarkets um, in Australia or onto, um, through international trading companies and are exported. So, um, last, so in regards to cropping, I mentioned that um, dry land systems often integrate livestock with um, crop growing. So we don't grow a lot of like, cereal cash crops um, because we are mainly a livestock producer, but we do grow under contract seeds for pasture. Um, like ryegrass and phalaris, which I introduced before, um, which then are sold on to other people for growing pastures to grow livestock on. Um, we also put in oats um, for feed for our own stock when, when grass gets low. Um, wheat and canola, um, we put in at the end of the drought when, we, when our stock numbers are actually down, but we're not traditionally a cereal grower, like I said. My uncle actually lives about 20 kilometres from us, and he grows a lot of canola and wheat. It's amazing, a short distance, totally different country, um, and he has much better cropping country there. Finally, um, perhaps most importantly, we run, we run, run sheep on our property. <coughs> so the left-hand side picture is actually a more recent one, um, and they're sort of in more confined areas as opposed to grazing, which they do most of their lives, um, because there's just no feed on the ground, so Dad's got in, them in there so he can more readily um, give them grain and things. There's just no natural feed on the ground for them. So, in regards to our sheep operation, some more jargon up there, sorry. Um, so we concentrate on prime land, which actually means breeding sheep for meat as opposed to wool. So um, sheep meat was just usually just a byproduct um, to wool growing, but it's actually become a, an industry in its own right and a really profitable sector. Um, Australia and New Zealand are known worldwide for their land production. So we used to run Merinos, which is the top with the horns. Um, they're prized for their wool, um, but as wool went out of favour as synthetic fibres came in, the breeding stock went down. Um, so there's a shortage of use for, for meat production as well. So in response, a company actually from my hometown called Lamb Pro um, developed this prime line composite wool which here, is on the right, and they developed um, genetics and also a marketing system that promoted the maximum efficiency of a breeder. It all sounds very business-like, but I guess it is, it is a business. Um, so these prime line ewes, which is a female, um, were developed to maximise um, kilograms per hectare as well, as well as dollars per kilo. So they're safe for self-replacing, so we keep their female um, that they birth and we send the boys off to market. Um, the two-prong approach we do is we join them to two different males. So 
when we join them to a merino ram, we're able to get the, the wool off the, off the breeders. Um, and we also self-replace. So if, we, if those two make, we often keep the females um, to self-replace our stock. However, we also um, join them with a dorset, which is the bottom left. They're like the jock of the sheep world. They're, they're high performance, they're rapid growth. Um, so their progeny are what we refer to as terminating. So all of the lambs that are bred from these two actually go to market. Um, and it's a really good combination because the prime lambs are really maternal. They've got a higher um, birthing rate. They can often birth more easily on their own, so it doesn't take a lot of um, input from the producer. And then they're a really fast growing meat from this guy down here. Um, so we usually sell our lambs between 19 and 24 kilos. Um, this can range from 4 to 12 months, depending on the growth of the sheep. Um, and those larger than 24 kilos actually usually are exported because um, a lot of countries don't like our taste in lamb. We usually have younger lambs and it's, much, it's a much stronger taste. But we've started producing bigger lambs to be sent to places like the US and Canada. So just quickly, a little bit more about lamb. Um, I'm doing some work as part of my FMRA program, um, looking at the Canadian lamb industry and also um, opportunities for Australian exports here. So the little case study I'll do is a comparative analysis of the lamb industry, looking at um, production as well as consumer differences in the markets. So the motivation for this work for me is twofold. First, uh, firstly, the personal connection, as you can tell from growing up on the farm, as well as um, in response to my time in Canada, I've been here for nearly nine months and I still am shocked by the, the lack of consumption of lamb. Um, often people don't know how to cook it, it's just it's not a popular piece of meat here. So in Australia, the leg of lamb is actually um, considered our national dish, um, we love it. And moving across the other side of the world to Vancouver, I thought the transition would be really easy. We've got the same Westminster system of government, we're both Commonwealth countries, we're very alike. Um, we get a lot of our policy directives from, from Canada, but the similarities just completely stopped when it came to land. It just, um, <laughs> the lamb I've had here is pretty old. Um, <laughs> and I've kind of stayed away from it, which is maybe why the general consumer population hasn't eaten it, or they've eaten it once and it was awful. Um, this is not a comment on Canadian lamb. Um, there's also exported stuff in the market as well. Um, but what's interesting, um, this just to just to mention, these stats include goat meat as well. I couldn't get any um, broken down further. But you can just see, compared to Australia and particularly New Zealand, um, Canada and the US consume tiny amounts of meat. And Australian consumption isn't really um, not confined to any particular group, whereas in the Canadian and US markets, it's really based on sometimes ethnic lines or also a small amount of um, consumers that want high value their food is also. Um, so you can see here, I've, I've been looking at the difference in production patterns. Um, so I'll just talk briefly to a few interesting things. Um, Australia, um, we, sh we saw a massive reduction, well not massive, it doesn't matter here. Um, oh dear, sorry. A huge reduction in sheep num numbers. Um, firstly, you'll see drops in terms of drought, but also when the bottom of the wool market really came out, people got out of sheep. Um, we've got quite large annual swings, but obviously our production is still relatively high. Um, in terms of New Zealand, which is the darker blue at the top, um, there was a big reduction in the 1980s when the industry was deregulated. Um, it's ha the sheep sector changed dramatically as they moved away from wool, but it's, it responded to the structural adjustment quite well and was stabilised. Um, and, they, and New Zealand producers like Australians have been able to get productivity gains, gains with um, a lower number of actual sheep. Um, so Australia and New Zealand are the second and third largest producers of lamb behind China, um, but they're actually the top two exporters and constitute 90% of the international exports in the market. So uh, onto the US, you can see the production is just a gradual decline. And the difference between the US and Australia and New Zealand is that 
when there was structural adjustment and after World War II when people stopped eating lamb and um, wool dropped as well, they didn't respond as well, I guess, structurally to the changes. So there's just been ongoing decline in inventory. There's also issues in the US and Canada with predators, um, which we don't have coyotes and things. We have foxes, but they're not quite as big and scary. Um, <laughs> so, and in regards to Canada, it's the sad little um, red line down here. It, you can't quite see it. It did decline with everyone else during the 70s and 80s. It's managed to pick up, pick up a little, but it hasn't picked up at the rate at which consumption has picked up. So Australia and New Zealand have, have fixed um, have fit that supply gap, filled, filled, sorry, filled the supply gap. And about 42% um, of the land consumed in Canada at the moment is domestically produced. So that's a huge, more than half is actually imported, mainly from New Zealand and, um, and Australia. So I guess the takeaway from this is to note that expanding into markets, particularly for Australia with such a small population base and growth rate, is really important, but it has to be in line with the consumer preferences um, in that market. As I said before, Australia and New Zealand are already producing bigger and older sheep because that's what consumers feel like. Um, so I'm doing a bit of econometrics work at the moment looking at if the assumption is Canadian production can increase, is there any room for New Zealand and Australian imports? Is there a consumer preference? And a lot of the reports out there are saying Canadians want to eat Canadian meat, but they just can't find it. So that's, a, that's obviously a concern for us if um, production grows up and there's no sort of opportunity for us to get in there. So um, moving on, I know you've talked, I think, with Mark a lot about the opportunities in Asia with growing demand and growing demand globally um, with population increases and growing um, middle class of consumers. So strong agricultural demand coupled with um, supply and land restrictions um, is a dr driving an enormous opportunity for agricultural trade. And there's actually a lot of talk in Australia at the moment about Australia becoming this global food powerhouse and will lead the next green revolution into Asia. Um, and I just want to respond to a few of those um, in the matter in the moment. Um, so, as I said, we've got a pretty small population with a relatively large agricultural base. And this has led some to assume that we can just feed the masses of growing China tomorrow. Um, I do agree that there's a huge opportunity because we currently produce enough food to feed a nation three times our size. But And our reputation is really strong in terms of health and safety of our food. But um, also, we grow, I don't know, being from Australia, the mining boom was just such, it constituted such, so much of our attention and our money and our investment for a good 20 years. But the refocus is sort of, we sort of put everything out of the ground we can. It's, it's quite depressing. So the actual the opportunity, agriculture has been, it was for a long time seen as more of a sunset industry and it's really, people are refocusing on it. So there are huge opportunities but there are an equal number of threats and constraints. Um, as I said, I introduced that we've always been known as this lucky country but I want to stress that there's no default lucky lock um, when it comes to the future of agricultural production. So, um, is everyone familiar with this spot analysis? Yep. So it's really it's a basic framework, but I think it's really powerful in prioritizing responses to markets. Um, so I'll use it briefly here. So firstly, the strengths on capitalizing this growing demand from Australia. We have advantages. Um, we're a reliable exporter. We've got a sort of clean and green reputation. We've got strong supply capabilities in meat and dairies and grains. And our re relative proximity to China and particularly those East Coast markets is really advantage. We've got a sound track record of innovation and our R&D, we put a lot of money into research and development through a funding structure that's equally born on producer and government. We do a lot of work on livestock genetics and production and processing um, technology as well. But there's a lot of weaknesses and a lot of commentators are really cautious of, about our ability to increase production. The first few look at our look at our weather, um, weather driest in the continent of the world, um, and our weather is becoming more volatile. We've also got really high input costs. Um, we've got a declining return on capital investment in agriculture. 